We are now to the third part of our four-part ceremony. Okay, everyone keeping up. So today we are so honored to have the Attorney General for the State of Oregon, Ellen Rosenblum, to, develop, to deliver this year's address. Ellen Rosenblum earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Oregon in 1971 and her law degree in 1975. She is a double duck. That's right. So she, um, she has, if after law school, she practiced law in both Eugene and Portland. And in 1980, she became an assistant U.S. attorney specializing in financial crimes. She was then appointed to the Multnomah County District Court and then the Multnomah County Circuit Court, where she served until she was appointed to the Oregon Court of Appeals in 2005. She can't hold a job. <laughs> she retired from the Court of Appeals in 2011. She then became elected to her first four-year term as Oregon's Attorney General in November 2012, and she was elected to her second term in November 26. She is the first woman to serve as the Oregon Attorney General. Her priorities as Attorney General include consumer, consumer protection and civil rights, advocating for and protecting Oregon's children, seniors, immigrants, and crime victims, and those saddled with education-related debt. She is committed to assisting district attorneys and local law enforcement in prosecuting elder abuse and complex crimes, and has made crimes against children as well as consumer internet privacy high priorities. She is also a great friend of the law school and has become a great friend of mine. And so it is indeed a pleasure for me to welcome Oregon's 17th Attorney General, Ellen Rosenblum, to the podium. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dean. I am as excited as I am honored to have been invited to speak to you all today on the occasion of the conclusion of your formal training as lawyers and the commencement of your lives in the law. Being an alum of the school, even though I missed out on its wonderful Agate Street home, makes this an especially sweet occasion for me and for my husband, who's here today and also graduated from the U of O Law a year before I did. So, President Schill, Provost Vannevar, Dean Burke, faculty, friends, alumni, and most significantly, the 3L class of 2019, including the LLMs and masters, Thank you for including me here in these festivities and for providing me with the occasion to give renewed thought to what my experiences at the School of Law and thereafter a life in the law have meant to me and how those experiences might provide inspiration on your way forward from this pivotal moment. And let me also thank all of you, the amazing parents, spouses, loved ones, kids, uh, friends who've supported these fantastic students through this hard, as we've already heard, process, but very much worth it. So let's hear it for all the parents and everyone here. Last Saturday, I was, as I was chatting outside in the beautiful weather with our new neighbors, Rose and Carter, I told them I had to go inside to work on a commencement speech. Carter, a smart and curious five-year-old, asked what that was. Wow, I thought this is going to take a little explaining. So I pretended the back deck was this stage and I began speaking extemporaneously. I told Carter this was a day of great importance in the students' lives. And then it came to me that I should ask Carter what was most important to him in his short life so far. In words very close to these, he thought for a moment and he said, learning to fix things that are broken. <laughs> Carter had just hit the nail on the head. That's what we lawyers do. Or, as one of my favorite judicial mentors, the beloved Owen Panner, 
would often say with great pride about what gives purpose to our profession, we are problem solvers. Carter, age five, and Judge Panner, who lived to the ripe age of 94, are both so very wise in their own ways. You may have thought that you've spent these past three years studying contracts or tort law or property or family law. And while that certainly can't be denied, I and Carter and Judge Panner would say you've been in training to become some of the world's best legal problem solvers as well. And now you've arrived. Congratulations on this day of hard-earned and well-deserved recognition and achievement. And thank goodness you've arrived, for if our world ever needed creative problem solvers, the time is now. In anticipation of today, I was eager to know more about you as a class. What I learned was revealing. For starters, you've come to this law school from 26 states and Washington, D.C. and British Columbia. And now I've learned several other countries uh, in the more advanced training. Uh, you represent 67 different colleges and universities. Many of you are, like me, that special species of waterfowl known as double ducks. 21% of you identify as students of color, and the women in your ranks outnumber the men by 53 to 47%. You speak many languages in addition to English fluently. You've been organic farm workers, bankers, carpenters, accountants, You've been in medicine and in our armed forces. Thank you for that. These, these intriguing bits of data are only part of your story. Among you are individuals who have beaten the odds. You've overcome poverty. You've recovered from addiction. You've escaped violence and triumphed over serious illness. This is a class that knows and experiences resilience. From your dean and from your teachers and your colleagues, I've learned about your other human qualities. You're personable, you're hardworking, you're really, really smart, and yours is a class known to have a wonderful quality of being genuinely hopeful. This last is vitally important, especially in light of the state of our country today. Let's face it, the rule of law is under siege. Or if you think that's an exaggeration, which I don't, at a minimum, the basic underpinnings of our democracy are being challenged as never before, at least in my lifetime. That is, you're beginning your professional lives at a time when our country is entering uncharted territory. It is no understatement to say that never have the skills you've obtained here at this law school been more necessary to our collective future. Tremendous problems surround us, and I for one am genuinely glad and relieved to know you're about to start helping us solve them, and many of you have already been doing that. I say this as someone who came of age personally and professionally during the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, the beginning of the women's and environmental movements, and Watergate. Watergate was certainly a fraught moment, but seems to pale by comparison with what we confront today, especially when you consider all the other monumental challenges now before us. You know as well as I do the big ones, climate change, gun violence, the rapid growth of economic inequality, the spread of hatred and bigotry, just to name a few. As I've reflected on the meaning of this day over the past few weeks, certain notions have emerged. The first is how much, despite being in a profession known to be somewhat change averse, things do change, both as to legal education and lawyering itself. It's pretty hard to imagine sometimes, but in many ways the good old days were far from good and they weren't even that long ago. Not all that long ago, for example, it was considered a waste of resources to train women to be lawyers. And if you don't believe that, read about some of the pioneer women lawyers like Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was asked by her law dean to explain why she was taking up a seat at Harvard that could have been made available to a man. When I was a student here, my class was the first to have more than 10% women, which it had inched up to by the class of 1974. Mine, the class of 75, took a sudden jump to nearly 30%. And you heard what the percentages are today. But even with the increase in women, and only a trickle of minorities, by the way, at that time, we were still something of a novelty, and we were treated as such. 
We were rarely called on in class. And I was personally warned against applying for certain summer clerkships in smaller Oregon towns. To make things more difficult, there were no full-time female faculty members to look to for guidance or as professional examples. As you heard, Professor Farrell, thank you and congratulations, came three years, three years too late for me. Uh, wish you had been there. Although we had certainly wonderful male faculty and deans. I am not by any stretch suggesting that sexism or racism in the law is now over. It is not, but here we are. 45 years later, we finally have a female state attorney general. Yay, thank you. The, <laughs> the, or the Oregon Supreme Court has a majority of women justices for the first time ever. And a woman as chief justice for the first time. And I hope that you have all met the intrepid Martha Walters, who's fantastic. And, and a duck, of course. And the soon-to-be-built Happy Valley High School near Portland will be named for Adrian Nelson, who last year became the first African-American justice to sit on either of our appellate courts here in Oregon. <laughs> Similarly, the new demographics of our law school show that true progress on diversity, equity, and inclusion are indeed possible, and that all of us are benefiting from this new reality Jessica, we have a long way to go, and thank you for leading the charge. With all of you, I think we can get there, but really appreciated your remarks and agreed with them. My colleague, New York's former Attorney General Barbara Underwood, someone I've come to admire, recently spoke about the importance of diverse leadership. That's one of the most important challenges of our times, A.G. Underwood said to bring into the courts and the boardrooms and in government and the academies and all the institutions of our society, all the voices, not just token representatives, to hear the voices of the people who are present and those who are not, and to build the bridges that are needed to unite rather than divide our large and diverse state and even our larger and more diverse nation. These words spoken by Barbara Underwood are every bit as important in a less diverse and smaller state like Oregon as they are in New York. But what about the law itself when I was a student? Roe v. Wade was decided in my 2L year. The year before, a jury handed down the largest plaintiff's verdict in history in Grimshaw v. Ford Motor Company, the exploding Pinto gas tank case. These marked the true beginnings of mass support for women's reproductive freedoms in America and the safety of consumers. During this time, Oregon adopted all manner of path-breaking legislation, from our Unlawful Trade Practices Act, to the state's public records law, to Oregon's pioneering land use law. But imagine this as well. When I was in law school, there were no trial practice clinics here, and no classes in what are now well-developed and very important areas of jurisprudence. Domestic violence was not yet even considered a distinct crime from assault and battery, and often was not prosecuted as such. Environmental law and gender discrimination as fields of legal study were just getting underway. Mediation, now an award-winning area of advanced study at this school, was unheard of as a career, let alone even a way to solve a case. What is clear is that lawyers and judges have been essential to advancing the law in so many important ways. Now it will take a new generation of smart, creative, innovative people like you to take us to the next level, especially as the digital world, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, and other threats to our privacy and security take over every space of our lives, from our homes to our workplace and beyond. In the midst of all this, what will never change is the moment in time that you have been here at the University of Oregon School of Law. My moment at U of O Law included many remarkable teachers. One was my first year torts professor, who later went on to serve in the state legislature, and then served with distinction as Oregon's attorney general, and became dean of this law school, and finally served with distinction as a transformational president of this university. Your dean's chair now bears his name, Dave Fronmeyer.
More than anyone I studied with here, Dave didn't just teach about the law. He showed us the policies underlying the law, and more important, how it can be used to improve people's lives. I suspect many of you greet this day with profound uncertainty. Others of you know, or at least you think you know, where you're headed. I honor and respect all of you, and I'm here to tell you from my experience that this degree you're receiving today can be your ticket to just about anywhere. Put a little more dramatically, the destination on the piece of paper that Dean Burke is going to be handing you reads quite clearly, doesn't it, Dean? The sky's the limit. I'm sure it says that. Of all my suggestions for you today, and there are a few more to come, first and foremost is to remain flexible in your professional career goals. Open, that is, to unexpected possibilities. Opportunities will come up that you never imagined. The job you thought for sure that you would find and be selected for, you may not find at all. Or if you do, it may not rise to the level of satisfaction that you hoped for. If you can remain flexible and open-minded, your careers are likely to be all the more satisfying. When I was in the shoes you wear today, I wanted with all my being to become a public interest lawyer. After all, that's what I went to law school for. I thought I had found my calling over a summer internship at Osberg, the public interest research group, and I hoped to parlay that experience into my first job. But I couldn't find work with any PERG anywhere, even out of state. So I chose instead to take a position with a small firm here in Eugene, a firm I'd clerked with. All three partners had graduated six years before from this law school and were developing niche practice areas. Happily, even back then, the law school taught legal writing really well, and I had learned to write appellate briefs and actually enjoyed oral advocacy. So entice, to entice me, this little Eugene firm offered the opportunity to argue some of the cases that I'd briefed for them. My job with Hammonds, Phillips, and Jensen, and my stomach-churning visits to Salem to argue cases in my first few years of practice turned out to be a tremendous experience, and even resulted in a significant interpretation by the Oregon Court of Appeals of the then new Oregon Public Records Law. Jensen V. Schiffman, still regularly cited by my office in our public records work, clarified that a closed criminal investigation was not exempt from the disclosure requirements of the public records law. And incidentally, Jensen was none other than my boss, who was standing in as the plaintiff for the ACLU of Oregon in that case. By the way, what goes around comes around, and my office is now heading up a study of the hundreds of public records law exemptions that have been created since then. There were 67 at the time. There's now over 600. So we have our work cut out for us. I also began my practice taking lots of criminal and juvenile court appointments right here in Lane County. I went to the jail most days after work to meet up with my adult age clients and spent most days in court learning by trial and hopefully not too much error. <laughs> Out of those experiences came fabulous role models, including Lane County judges, uh, then the only woman on the bench, Helen Fry, uh, but also wonderful male judges like Ed Levy, who to this day is my all-time favorite. There have been all sorts of unexpected opportunities along the way. Most telling is that today I finally have a job that really does focus on consumer protection. So much so that when asked how I describe my job, I usually answer that I think of my role as the mother bear protecting her young cubs. And I even got myself a bracelet, this right here, that says on it, Mama Bear. So I mean it with all my heart when I tell you that the word opportunity is, is written in invisible but indelible ink across each of the diplomas you'll be receiving today, along with the sky's the limit. I again urge you, be open to the possibilities this degree will put in your path. My own experiences are also why I know the world will open itself up to you in ways you cannot begin to imagine today if you do your part and keep pushing forward while maintaining that resilience and hopefulness that you are known for. Your legal education puts you in a profession that's front and center of so much of the life of our state and country, and it gives you a built-in family. Right here, your teachers and classmates, you can always draw on. Spoiler alert, I would be remiss if I did not repeat the importance of that last point. I know not all of you are going to be practicing in Oregon, but in this modern age, it's pretty easy to stay connected, right? There's simply no greater power center for you as a practicing lawyer than those who are assembled here today and the alums of this school who are spread out 
throughout our state and to a lesser degree our, our country and the world at large. We all want you to succeed and we will do our level best to support you. So don't wait to reach out. And that includes just about anything you can think of that relates to your new profession. Anything from advice on a case, to the extent ethically proper, to what to wear, to what organizations to join and committees to sign up for, to your next job transition. Some of your best mentors could just as likely be lawyers who are only a few years out of school as the senior partner in the corner office. This is what I see when I look back on my career. Every step of the way, I have been lifted up by others. Connections developed through this law school, through getting to know judges and litigators, as well as the many and diverse bar activities that I've been involved in at the county, state, and national levels. These have all helped me determine my course. If you make it a point to develop relationships and nurture them, you can do almost anything this new ticket allows you to do. One thing I've learned is that everyone loves lists. So I'm going to close by giving you one. Here, in no particular order, is a baker's dozen of practical thoughts to help you jumpstart your careers. Number one, reputation is everything. Your word is your bond. Related to this, never disparage another lawyer, or judge, of course, or miscite a case. Instead, be the lawyer judges and opposing counsel trust. Number two, be flexible and open-minded, and opportunities you may never have imagined will come your way. Three, the most successful lawyers are the best prepared lawyers. Four, seek out mentors and be a mentor to others. Five, be a good listener. It's just as important as being a good talker and a good writer. In this vein, request feedback about your performance on your writing and your oral presentations in court. Six, words are golden. Be succinct, thorough, and persuasive in your writing. And I know that your writing program is the best in the country and that it's taught you that. But find yourself when you're out there and you don't necessarily have your professors to turn to, a good copy editor. Typos are not okay, even if the result, they result from autocorrect. Seven, most jobs in the legal profession involve teamwork these days. Treat job interviews as opportunities to pitch yourself as a team player. Eight, engage in community and public service. After all, you went to the University of Oregon Law School. Nine, don't under underestimate the importance of networking inside and outside legal circles. Even introverts can learn to network. I'll help you. <laughs> Number 10, take part in the campaign for equal justice. We must support access to justice for all. 11, join lawyer organizations that will give you chances to develop leadership skills, advance the profession, and of course, have some fun and network. 12, take care of yourself starting now. Being a lawyer is hard work, and so is studying for the bar. Good luck. <laughs> and 13, from this day forward, Dean, I promised you I'd say this. This law school and its alums are your extended family. Come back for reunions. Stay connected and support it financially when you're able to. So that's my list for you. I hope I've made it abundantly apparent how proud I am to be a lawyer and how excited I am to be able to lend you my support and encouragement as you join this worthy profession and enter the next phases of your careers. Because yours is a class that is clearly full of prospective leaders, I cannot wait to see how all this plays out and to visit with you in the future as you embark upon what are sure to be fascinating professional lives. Again, it is such an honor to have been present at this special moment, and I offer you all hearty congratulations and my very best wishes in the years ahead. Thank you for having me today.